earlier, actually, it was going to be Eat, Pray, Love, but then when it turned out that this conversation was going to occur in Singapore, then people said that change the pray to shop because after all, shopping is the number one religion in Singapore. So it has therefore become Eat, Shop, Love. And the way I interpret that title is that we are going to be talking about how technology is affecting experiences which give life a meaning. Um, experiences uh, without which we will not really feel fulfilled as, as human beings. I have it on the good, good, good authority of my wife that shopping is one of them, uh, <laughs> that it really gives life a meaning. Also, my younger colleagues um, try to convince me that, that swiping left, swiping right is also something that gives life meaning. So, uh, so apparently, even that is uh, very important. So we are going to tackle uh, some of those experiences and how technology is, is changing the landscape of those, those experiences. Uh, and when we say technologies, we obviously mean digital technologies. Uh, we are going to explore how the digital footprints that we are leaving as we experience um, uh, some of those things, um, um, eating, shopping, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, as we experience them, the, the digital footprint that we leave, uh, how that can be analyzed using big data tools, using artificial intelligence, and what can be then said about who we are, what we are, who we like, who we don't like, etc. Um, we were supposed to be joined by Anki Tibos of Zilingo. Unfortunately, she has taken rather ill today, uh, so she couldn't be here with us, so we do wish her a speedy recovery, uh, but we will try to compensate uh, as best as we can for Anki T's, uh, uh lack of presence here. Um, so with that, I would like to start, um, and you already know the panelists, they have been introduced, uh, but before I start, I would like to, 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 uh, to actually do uh, some sort of a rapid-fire quiz with you. Uh, basically, I'm going to ask you three, four questions uh, in, in quick succession, and you just have to vote uh, using a mechanism that you've now become very familiar with. Uh, just a, It's a simple yes-no, um, so please humor me and join me in, in telling us if you do have on your phone a shopping app, so just a yes or no. Uh, do you have on your phone a shopping app? And we'll see the results very soon. Um, Who are the 16%? OK, so 85%, <laughs> yes. So 85% of the people here do have uh, a shopping app. Um, do you have on your phone a restaurant rating app? Uh, a restaurant rating app, uh, yes or no? This will be... What, what's your guess? I think 90% will have one. Yeah? 90%, okay. yes. Okay, let's see the results then. Okay, a restaurant rating app. No. 58%, <coughs> yeah. Do you have on your phone a fitness stroke healthcare app? You would like to know the answer to this one? What do you think? What's your guess? What's your guess? I mean, if you're talking about healthcare only, then not very high, but including fitness, then it's high. See? Okay. See? Okay, so... I'm quite it's, correct now. Wow, okay. So we are pretty much... The entire population has one of those two. Okay. Do you have on your phone a banking stroke payment app? Yeah. Okay, banking... Okay, so I'd like it's also know, universal. I'd like to know who the other 10 people who don't have these apps are. <laughs> Final question. And this one should be very easy. Do you have on your phone a dating app? Not officially. <laughs> no. Oh. We, no, we do. Audience, we do not have any statistics on your marital status. So please be honest in answering that question. Um, I think Facebook is doing dating now too. So. Okay. All right. So, 13 percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's, let's start off this discussion now, and uh, let me start with, with you, Jeff. Um, we doctor. You did a pre-IPO uh, financing round, $500 million. You're already valued at, what, $5.5 billion. Um, 
270,000 doctors yeah. uh, empaneled? That's right. Okay. And you already have some 27 million active users? And we have 160 million registered users. Okay. So, le okay, let me not do the publicity for you, but let me... Let, let I can do that myself. <laughs> yeah, you can do that yourself. <laughs> but, but let me ask you, how do you see you, the basic proposition of your business and how does it relate to a smart city context? Because we doctor is possibly a solution for a rural setting where you don't have access to good doctors uh, that you know of and you would like to be connected via a platform, which is what you are. Uh, but is it also something that would work in a smart city context, you think? Yeah, so I think healthcare is actually something that's very interesting. If you look at most of the space that has been disrupted by internet, uh, their services tend to be more online focus. So majority of the services can be done online. You look at e-commerce, um, you buy something, then there is some offline element where they need to deliver to you. But in terms of the shopping experience, in terms of selection, payment, it's all online. I think as of this day and age, as of today, or in the near or midterm, healthcare services will still need to be offline. It's still a more personalized. Online is more of a, what we consider um, help you to solve some of the more initial stage from whether you need to see a doctor to if you need to see a doctor, what type of doctor you need to see. That is what we have traditionally called telemedicine. Right? That's what we have right. traditionally called telemedicine. Right. If you're talking about a doctor who sees you for the first time and just tells you you have some rare illness and you need to take some very expensive medicine, that is just not realistic. Hmm. Um, so as part of the if you think about it as part of a smart city, what technology or what we can help is really make that process a lot more efficient as well as more pleasant for, from a user-patient perspective. That from as simple as digital appointments, so you don't have to go stand there and wait for hours on end just to go see a doctor um, <coughs> all the way till a lot of the medicine delivery. <coughs> you can buy it online or if you have chronic disease, you can get your medicine refilled online have it delivered to you rather than you go offline to a hospital system again. So it's all about, and from a supply side or from a doctor perspective, it's a, or hospital perspective, it's about driving the more targeted user to the hospital. So are you buying the best expertise that is out there or are you saving time? What is, what it, are you doing? It, it is both. Okay. It is about, number one, the top specialists should be doing what, it, what they're doing best, which is surgery and life-saving things. They should not be seen someone and who has a fever and giving them Panadol. Second, it's about if I have something, I want to see the best doctor, I have access to that. So it is about both sides. Okay, okay. Now, Joel, let me come to you. Um, so yours was a sort of a strange journey in the sense that you ran a business which was acquired by Groupon, then you became the CEO of Groupon Malaysia, and then you acquired Groupon, and in... During all this time, Groupon went from being the poster child of consumer-facing e-commerce to nothing. Um, now, you were in that couponing business, but you have taken elements of that into your business, but that's now, a lot of that is also payments. So tell us a little bit about my fave, and also how does payment get into the whole experience of shopping, and how critical is that? Yes, so I'll start with China, right? Um, mainly because I think Southeast Asia, uh, the opportunities mirror closer to China. And uh, my experience in Groupon is that as an American company in like 48 countries at its peak, uh, it's very difficult to innovate beyond the vertical service they're providing in the more Western market across to other Southeast Asian or emerging markets. Um, so anyone who has worked in whether it's Visa or PayPal, um, you know, finds that challenge, right, uh, to how do you actually break uh, you know, new boundaries in emerging markets. So when I was running the Asia business in Groupon uh, for four years, uh, that was our biggest challenge. Uh, so it was always this um, one playbook, right? Um, you know, you build and the customers will eventually figure a way to sign up for a credit card, whether in Indonesia or India, to eventually transact for your service. Um, so that, I, I think that uh, th that type of direction just doesn't work in emerging markets. 
Um, so what I did was um, somewhat like a management buyout, so in which where we acquired back the Groupon business that I sold, mm. um, and then we took it and modeled it very similar to what we see the opportunities in China. So the uh, largest uh, Groupon clone back then in China was called Meituan, and today Meituan is uh, filing for an IPO for I think sixty billion dollars, and they've evolved their business so rapidly. Um, so if you look at it today, like all consumer internet companies. Uh, the business model that they have scaled up is most of the time not the business model they started with. Sorry, Mate One is a food delivery business, right? Which is different from yours. It actually started it with started as a couponing. Coupon buying okay. business. It started with couponing, and then it, it went into travel, movies, food delivery, um, you know, payments, transportation. Yeah. So I think it's kind of like um, uh, you know, building on top of the first use case, but innovating uh, till in this region we call it a mutant. So you, take like, you, you kind of take a model that could get you from you know, zero to one, but one to 100 is that you've got to localize the product uh, and, and serve the local consumer needs. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, Suresh, you do something which is a little different from these two gentlemen because yours is a pure business-to-business -business solution. You are dealing with a lot of legacy businesses as well, such as telcos, airlines, banks, etc., um, which have existed even before digital things started happening in our, in our world. Um, and you are trying to tell them how to make sense of the digital footprints that I was talking about earlier. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about how that is actually working out. And what we are especially interested in knowing is whether artificial intelligence is really a buzzword or it's, it's really what it is crack, you know, cracked up to be. Okay, that's a lot of very hard questions in one, but let me try and start with them. So I think first, just going back to the idea of each shop love, right? The problem that we're trying to solve in Crayon is very simple. Today, most of us in this room, and the top one billion customers and consumers in the world, we can all eat, shop, love, entertain, travel to our heart's content. We have all the money to do it. So money and capital <coughs> for that, even consumer capital, is not the problem. What we lack is time. We do not have the time to enjoy our lives, to eat, to shop, to love, to do all these things. And, and, and that's a very peculiar uh, state of affairs. And why is this happening? It's because, for example, just take a simple decision. You want to make a decision to go and eat somewhere. Today you will say, hey, okay, I don't know this restaurant. Then you start reading some reviews. The reviews are conflicting. You have too much information, right? By the time you go through six to 12 reviews, ask three friends on Facebook, do all of these internet searches, you spend 45 minutes on something as simple as that, and then you say, forget it, um, you know, let me just go to the same place I went to all the time. Because it just takes too much time. There's so much information out there that it takes too much time. And it's very funny, it's a paradox of choice, right? If there's so much choice and there's so much information about the choice, there should be something that's perfect for me. But I can't find it. Yeah. So that's really the problem that we're trying to solve. Our AI engine is basically trying to say, can I understand people as individuals so well, your personal taste and need, shop, travel, entertainment so well that you can actually just find the top four or five things that matter to you in that particular moment. Um, we're not a B2C business, as you rightly pointed out, because one of the things we believed is that, you know, yes, you can go and be a billion people, you can have a footprint of a billion people that you touch, but then that's a very capital-intensive business. However, on the other hand, if you work with airlines, banks, people like this, who have hundreds of millions of customers, mm -hmm. We solve two problems. These enterprises are actually terrible at understanding their customers and serving them. When was the last time you opened anything that your bank sent you in terms of email or SMS, you know? On the other hand, you always open something that Netflix or Spotify recommends to you. So our business model and our engine says, I will take you, Mr. Bank, Mr. Airline, and try and make you behave like or give you the capability to be like Netflix or Spotify or Amazon. So that, in a sense, is what we do. And in the process today, we touch about 125 million customers. So it's not, it's not a billion, but it will be soon, hopefully. Mm -hmm. We see more transactions of these customers that we use to create these, these footprints. The transactions today are greater than the GDP of about 90 countries in the world. So again, growing, and we hope to make it more universal. But what we do out there is essentially we take the data from that enterprise, mm -hmm. and we match it to what's outside in the world. And then we come back and say, here are for each individual customer that you have. Here are a set of four or five choices that should make sense, that saves the customer time, that allows the enterprise to also target them better. So that's, in a sense, what we do. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to 
uh, your choice engine in a bit. But before that, I want to ask Jeff about that Internet of Things angle that you have uh, in your business, which is the, the, the intelligent healthcare devices. What exactly are those and what do they do? So in, uh, in within China, we have a product. Uh, we don't have a very good English name yet, but um, we have a pretty good Chinese name for it. But it's basically the easiest way to think about it is a, it's like an Amazon Echo, but with a screen that sits in your home. So okay. it's a smart speaker, but you press one button, your digital uh, health record is shared with that doctor. And within, uh, right now we guarantee 15 minutes, but on average time, waiting time is about 80 seconds. You get a doctor and you do a video com consultation with the doctor. Um, the reason why we came up with this was we, we were looking at whether we can do something that makes it easier, even quicker for people to see a doctor. Because again, like what I mentioned earlier, seeing a doctor is a very personalized thing. Mm -hmm. right? You're not, it's not like playing games or Groupon or you're just going to be in a subway and they're just going to be talking to your doctor and say, hey, I have this rashes or I have this you know, certain type of condition because it's a very personalized type of uh, services. So your, the, the, the scenario or the stage that tend to happen with that service is actually your home or somewhere that's more private, whether it's your office, uh, but tend to be more your home. Um, so we created this product for people to have it at home that can easily for them to access the core service that we offer. Hmm. Uh, now, you used to be a tech investment banker, Jeff. What happened? I mean, what... what <laughs> What brought you yeah, to don't hold that against me, huh? <laughs> okay. What brought you to this world? Um, so I, I was a tech banker for many, many years. I think I was in banking for 14, 15 years. Um, and one of the things over the years, obviously, is there is a trend of more and more people going from professional services into corporates. Yes. Um, or startups, entrepreneurs. Um, and over the years, I've been approached by a lot of number of people uh, with different type of companies. And that really appeal to me. And so I decided to make the jump. And I have to say, it's, it was probably one of the best career decisions I ever made. It's a lot more tougher than banking, I would say, in right. terms of hours, in terms of the stress. Because now, any decision you make is not transactional based anymore. Any decision you make can actually affect the company. It can affect the 3,000 employees that we have. And in banking, you do an M&A deal. After the M&A deal, you kind of say, I got my fees, I'm gone. And now there's only one IPO that you need to care about, right? <laughs> well, I'm working on multiple. We have a few investee companies that's going IPO. Okay. But even post the deal, you have to make sure the integration happens. Yeah. So it's very different. Right. Joel, now um, coming to you, uh, and, and I want to take you to, to this question of couponing. When, when, when you give me a deal or a coupon, now if you may want or you may force me to think about a need that I may not have felt uh, in terms of buying something or eating somewhere. Uh, so you are actually inducing me to do something that I may otherwise not have done exactly at that point in time. On the other hand, if uh, taking a situation that Suresh was mentioning, if I'm really feeling hungry in Tokyo and I want to go and, and eat somewhere, then I... I need recommendations from people who know. And that may matter more to me than a discount. Um, and at the end of it, there is probably also the question of whether I have the right money, the right denominations, the right currency. Um, and it's also a question of whether I can actually find that place. So maybe you know, geolocation services are also involved. So what I'm getting at is that in a smart city context, do you eventually see sort of independent businesses such as yours surviving as independent businesses? Or do you think it will, you will all sort of have to fall into some, some, some gigantic mishmash, which will be the only point of contact for the consumer? Yeah. So I think in terms of your question on couponing, right? Um, I think generally that goes a, a little bit against human nature, right? So as much as we like to imagine that humans like to discover multiple restaurants, but actually we prefer to spend more time going to the places we like going to, right? So 80%, I mean, we have this aspirational dream that we're going to be trying all these different restaurants, but that's usually the upper middle class, but the masses, usually it's normally 10, 15 restaurants. They love, they keep going back, right? So, um, so that's why last year we built a product uh, which is a payments loyalty product, that now today is about 80% of our business compared to couponing that we acquired uh, mm -hmm. the coupon business from. So we find that actually solving... So how uh, is that different? 
Oh, so it's, it's quite simple. So it's integrated mobile payments, and we make mobile payments useful in a case where now businesses can connect with the consumers by offering very uh, specific restaurant loyalty rewards back to the consumer. Okay. So, um, yeah, so and that's only possible because of the growth of mobile payments uh, over the past year uh, that mm -hmm. the governments have been pushing. Um, so, yeah, so I think couponing essentially is getting new customers to uh, a restaurant, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, payments loyalty, which is actually a larger space to tackle, uh, where today if you come in to a restaurant, you pay cash, you pay credit card, uh, the, the merchants actually don't get anything back in return. There's no way for them to contact you. Um, and uh, so now restaurants are giving that incentive to the consumer, and now there's an incentive for consumers to use cashless or mobile payments. So I think this whole like mobile payments, cashless agenda has been being pushed for many years, mm. but there's actually no real value proposition in the past two, three years. And that's why in the past, uh, for Faith, uh, in the past one year, we have actually grown to become the fastest growing mobile payments uh, within Malaysia. And do you see it, uh, okay, Malaysia and Singapore? Yeah. Uh, you are also present in Indonesia. Indonesia. Uh, do you see mobile payments payment sort of picking up in uh, a big way there as well? Yeah. So, so, so I think that one, one thing that's, uh, that you see in China, like what's driving mobile payments is this model that we call venture capital to consumer model, right? So you raise a lot of money and then you take venture capital money and just pump it in for cashbacks, discounts to consumers. Um, so what we've been doing methodically is actually getting merchants to fund it. In return, they get more customers, they get more data. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, mobile payments is still, uh, or cashless is still uh, a very small sliver. It's growing uh, fast. I think there are two or three players that are investing into it, but still uh, they're burning a lot of money, right, uh, to, to kind of build that space. Uh, so we, we haven't, um, you know, we, we don't want to go in and just create a VC to C model. Mm. So we've been focused a lot more on the markets where we find we can actually get uh, better growth. VC to C model, that's yeah. an interesting term. Uh, <laughs> Suresh, uh, I promised to ask you about your choice engine, um, so let me do that. And also, if you can talk a little bit about what, what surprising things that uh, have you learned about consumers in this region that even you sort of were not expecting to learn about them? So I think, um, see, choice is fundamentally one of those reasonably complex things, right? Like I said, when we actually try to, I mean, many of us travel, we take a flight, we go somewhere, and we want to find somewhere to eat. And typically, we've kind of reduced it to a simple equation that we say, you know, it depends on my taste. I might like vegetarian food. I might like Japanese food. I might like sushi and not teppanyaki. So these are your personal tastes. There's another bit of thing, which is the influence is on you, right? I might just say, hey, if I'm going to Hong Kong, I'm going to call one of these two gentlemen because they know Hong Kong and I trust their recommendation, but I'm not going to trust him. But in KL, I will trust him. So influences matter on you. I think lots of the current... Your past behavior also matters. I mean, like any of us who travel know, the first three, four days, we're trying to say, let me experience the local food. On the fifth day, you're like, I want something more familiar, right? You know, you have, and each of us is different in that. The problem with all of this is that this is a fairly complex decision that today only human beings do, where they put this together themselves. And that's why you're spending so much time. You're trying to see what those reviews are. You're trying to see what, you know, is available locally, whether it's got an offer or not. You're trying to ask a few friends about what this stuff, and is there an engine that can actually intelligently put this all together? And that really says at the end of it, there's a bunch of choices that are really relevant for you. So that, that's, that's the engine that we're building. So in a way, it's like if you've seen that movie, Her, it's like that OS is learning about that person and trying to say, listen, I know what you want almost before you want it. Right. And um, what's interesting is, um, in fact, you know, I won't say it's a contradiction, but I think there's a competing reality. We see all kinds of people. We see people who are... They just want to do the same thing again and again and again. Right. And you see people who are wildly innovative in not choosing the same things again. We see f consumers do very funny things. In your hometown, you tend to do things that you have done again and again. Right. But when you travel, you are wildly experimentative in terms of trying new cuisines and doing that. So I don't think it's possible to bucket and say, there's only one insight that we're getting. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is that all human beings have their own peculiarities about how they actually do this, this stuff. And discovery is a particularly interesting thing to the point that you just made. Even when I do the same thing again and again, one thing that we're learning is consumers want to see something that they're discovering, right. whether or not they okay. actually buy it. Sorry, I have to... Because we are running out of time, and there's this question that I have to ask you, Jeff, um, because this has been an important question here in Singapore about uh, data privacy. Because uh, you are in a business where you are collecting a lot of very personal, intimate, 
um, important, crucial for, uh, from people's perspective, uh, private data. Um, how are you managing the security of that? Under what framework are you working in China? And because here, even the prime minister's health records uh, got hacked. So there is a big concern about uh, businesses such as yours and whether they are mushrooming without any sort of legal frameworks around them. Yeah, so data privacy and data security is one of the uh, very key important thing that we focus on. Um, our data comes from a few different sources. We have 2C data, so consumer directly signing on to our app using our services. We have data that's coming directly from the government, meaning the government are our customers, and from there we help their population within each city or province to do uh, medical services. Uh, we also have business that we work with um, that we get data from. So data privacy and security is very important to us. Um, so what we do is, obviously we can't just say, you know, let's say an insurance company comes and say, oh, we want to better target, manage our risk, uh, can you just give me your, your data of your users? Obviously, right. we can't do that. Right. But can we, uh, once the data become a core metadata, where you actually don't link back to any individual, their, pro their phone number, ID, so it's just a profile, mm. then from there, we do data analytics, or we use that to build our AI services, then that is something that we can do. Mm. So I think data privacy, especially the data that we have, is actually, like you said, very, very uh, sensitive because it actually in involves individuals' um, uh, health records. So we take that as a very serious in terms of how we, how we uh, use it and how we protect it. Okay, all right. Uh, do you see a lot of privacy concerns among your uh, clients? Are there? Absolutely, and I think um, the lady in the morning talked about it, but I think we are seeing now um, a move towards everybody saying, we want to get the benefits of using the data, which is I want to personalize. I want to actually be able to be very targeted, not waste people's time. But yet now people are saying, how can technology help me do this without actually tracking the individual everywhere? And part of that is happening because, you know, you can have technology, you can have anonymized, you know, you can anonymize stuff, you can encrypt identity. And, but, so part of it is coming from the tech world, but the other part of it is interestingly coming from regulation. And I think it's not just GDPR, now practically every country in the world, the US apart, um, every country in the world is actually putting in place something close to GDPR. I mean, you know, it's either GDPR light or heavy or something around that. But I think we'll have a situation in a year or two where GDPR will be the law or something like that in most of the world outside of the US. Right. Joel, you, you have any final words on the issues of consent and data privacy and data security? Yeah, so for, for us, like one of the areas we find that data can provide a lot of value is actually data of small businesses. So the problem a lot of times for small businesses is actually getting loans, financial services. So a lot of, and, and actually that's the biggest problem. When I first started my, you know, my first startup, it's almost impossible to, to kind of get a loan. Uh, restaurant owners, you know, you, so, so we've got a, a very pretty in-depth data set of these restaurant owners in terms of their customer health, in terms of their revenues, in terms right. of number of transactions. And actually, uh, right now, you know, as we go out there and we're talking to potential like financial services providers and banks, we find that there's actually a lot of desire to collaborate on that data set to help small, medium businesses. Because today, um, it, 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 this segment is really underserved right. because of the lack of data. Uh, to help them. Yeah. All right. And I'm afraid we are totally out of time. We have overshot a little bit. Uh, so we would have to end this fascinating conversation here. It was great talking to all of you. Uh, so thank you, my wonderful thank panelists. You. You. And with that, eat, shop, pray. Sorry. Eat, shop, love. Uh, the panel is done. Thank you.